What is going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Pod Scum. This right here, as you all know by now, is the podcast where we dive into the deep, dark, murky waters with a plethora of legendary guests. I am, of course, your host, your bastard of ceremonies, the number one scumbag, Rex Ruger. That's R E Triple X. You might also know me as AKA the King of Sleaze, AKA the Hair Metal High Priest, and most importantly, AKA Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. Take a look, folks. Should be pretty obvious that you are looking at the son of glam, the front man for the band. Just smoked a few grams. I got a million fans. I'm your ice cream man, Mr. Wap Bop Loo Bop Wap Bam Bam Shazam. Hot damn. Whew, feeling good? Of course, looking good. Everybody in the house looking good, including you all out there. You know how I get that done. Right there, kids. You too can look, well, almost this good. Coming to you as always from the Lavender Lounge of Love. And joined as always by the great Keith Hernandez puppet right there. Bringing you, of course, the No Frills podcast. No frills, but plenty of thrills. And that's looking at this face. So you're welcome. And if you're watching right now, please like and subscribe to the channel. And be sure to follow Pod Scum on Facebook. That's right. Lo and behold, we are on Facebook. How the hell they let us on there is beyond me, folks. But they did. So, you know, there goes the neighborhood, kids. Anybody can get on Facebook. Of course, they can also put you in jail, which has happened to me a lot. But I digress with all that. Today, I'm very happy to have a return guest today. Not a return guest because you guys ain't seen him yet. He was one of the uh, guests or the episodes that unfortunately got lost uh, in the midst of my technical difficulties. And he has been so kind and so gracious uh, to do a repeat episode for me. Uh, because I was really crushed. I was crushed losing all the interviews, uh, but particularly, you know, one with a, uh, a, a true legitimate hardcore legend, uh, who happens to play in, uh, one of, no, I'm not, let, let me stop myself right there. The greatest New York hardcore band of all time. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the great Agnostic Front right there, folks. If you can't see it, Agnostic Front live at CBGB's. Let's walk down that uh, that that memory lane with him. He's here now. Let's chop it up with my pods. Come on, pumped. Let's go. Oh, wow. Hold on there, Craig. Let me get my old man glasses on here, man. Jesus. Craig Silverman, Agnostic Front. First of all, I was telling my guests before you came on here, super cool that you were willing to do this again because of my te of my technical difficulties. Uh, uh, you were one of the episodes that I lost. I uh, was super bummed. In, in total, I lost about, I think, six episodes, man. Everybody's been super cool, though, about coming on and redoing them. But, you know, technology kind of has us over a barrel, you know? I got it. You know? But it's I'm, I'm, it's so great that you were able to do this again, uh, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh no I, I, I want to jump right in here, man, because uh, I think I might have asked you this the last time. But I, I'm I'm interested when you're out there in your travels. Uh, you know, hardcore is so synonymous uh, uh, to me. You know, w w with that very, you know, it, it seems like it's a it's an attitude. You know, what I mean, and 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 very blue collar, workman like. Uh, uh, does that ethos and that attitude, uh, you know, still exist today? Definitely. Was I? I I'd like to say yes, but. Uh... It's just like anything else. Everything changes. Everything evolves over time. I mean, I, I remember when hardcore was it, was, it was it was a very violent subculture. It was scary yeah. to, to go to shows back then. Uh, uh, I I liked the way it felt uh, for some reason. I don't know why. I like being yeah. someplace that was dangerous. Right. But it's a lot safer now. It's, it's And that's not a, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just different. So I think that the... The, the kinds of kids that that get into it, I'm glad that anybody is still interested in in yeah and 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 listening to the music uh, and 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 being a part of the scene. But it's it's definitely different. I'd like to say yes, definitely with a, a with the older bands that still holds true. I think, but yeah, it does. With with the younger bands I, or and younger fans, I I really don't know. And it doesn't. It, it's not a good thing or a bad thing either way. It's it's. Just, I'm just happy that people are keeping it going. Um, what was it that got you specifically into hardcore? Like, was there an album or an artist or a song that particularly got you into it? So ironically, I think we talked about this the, the last interview. 
I saw Agnostic front at CBGB in March of 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, first hardcore show I ever went to. And that hooked me in. Um, I said I'd never, I'd never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, like the, the craziness inside, was just for uh, you know, for a thirteen-year-old kid. Yeah, it was a lot to digest. Great parents too, letting you go to CBGBs at thirteen. A lot of applause from your folks. Oh, they didn't know. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> being being the middle child, they, they didn't really care all that much either. Plus, it was just a, it was a quick bus ride and from New Jersey. So, and I think, and I think the last time we talked though, like you said though, and I don't know if this is the show you're specifically talking about, but you know, you talk about that, like that, like that healthy apprehension and that fear. Is that the show specifically that you're talking about? Like where you went and everything was kind of unknown and you felt that little bit of fear? Well, it was in, in general. I've, so I went to CBGB matinees for two more years after that. And then I moved to Boston. Yeah. Uh, and then I started going to and where I knew nobody. Uh, yeah, and you know, Boston was was different. You know, still scary when you know nobody and you're 15 years old. Yeah, but uh, you know, eventually you get to know people, and it's not as scary. You just watch the people you know do scary things. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, is it safe to say that after New Yorkers, Bostonians, the next scariest class of people? Boston was very violent, uh, yeah. and and continued to. It got more and more violent throughout the 90s. Yeah. Uh, yeah but I, I'd say in the 90s, Boston was far more violent than New York. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 uh, how did COVID treat you guys? I, I can't remember. What did you guys have going on around 2020? Did COVID, when all that shit hit in 2020 and everything got derailed, what was going on in the agnostic front camp at the time? Did that derail and fuck up a lot of things for you guys? Of course. Just like everybody else. I mean, we... Yeah. We did our last tour in January of 2020, right before everything started. Because I remember being over there and everybody was talking about this, you know, mysterious virus. Uh, and it was contained to China, but everybody knew. And I knew at that point when they said it was contained to China, yeah. it was already out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no uh, shit. It was, already, <laughs> it was already everywhere by that point. Um, but yeah, so we were sidelined uh, and did our our next shows back were may of last year and we've been busy ever since yeah Vinny and roger just really seem to uh uh just uh not age i'll say it i mean you, you know <laughs> i mean i mean those guys are out there hitting the road and, and and hitting it harder than bands easily half their age man like these guys have really seemed to discover the fountain of youth maybe there's something the hardcore keeping you young Vinny stigma still seems to be a teenager to me well when you're a part of a subculture like this, it does keep you young because you're around a lot of young people. Yeah. And Stigma's going to be 68 years old. God bless him. Like, Jesus. To look at him, and never mind the way he acts. You'd right. never know that he was 68 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it definitely uh, it definitely keeps you young. What was it about hardcore, though, that first connected, you know, uh, you know, was it the loud music? Was it the speed of it? Like, was it the brutality of it? Like, was it the sense of community? Uh, you know, the exchange of the energy? Was it all of those things? You know, was there one thing that really got you hooked into hardcore that really resonated with you a lot? It wasn't any one thing. I was, I was already pretty heavily into thrash metal by the time I discovered yeah. hardcore. You know, I was already into Metallica and Venom yeah. and Slayer. Uh, and I love the speed, of yeah. the speed, thrash metal, whatever you want to call it. But it wasn't as aggressive as hardcore punk. Uh, right. There was a. It, 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 I started playing guitar when I was six years old, so you know, I appreciated musicianship my entire life. Hardcore bands weren't necessarily. Uh, 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 didn't get high marks in that department back then. Right. I mean, a very sloppy, but very, very primitive, uh, and just aggressive. Uh, the attitude was much, much different than uh, yeah. than like metal bands. But I still, you know, I, I loved, uh, I loved, uh, I loved metal back then. I still do. Yeah, but, me uh, too. But uh, you know, hard thrash metal was. Up. You're saying thrash was the gateway drug. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, yeah. I didn't get into. So a lot of the, like the the a lot of guys my age group that got into hardcore like they started off with punk, 
yeah, that, that didn't happen with me. So I went from listening to bands like Kiss, Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, Black Sabbath, yeah, to listening to bands like Iron Maiden, Saxon, Judas Priest, Motorhead. Then from there, I discovered Metallica. I saw Metallica open for Venom in the spring of 1983, and that was it. Then I was hooked. Yeah, no uh, turning back. But uh, I didn't discover uh, really any punk rock bands until, what, 1985, 86? Yeah. Um, but I was already heavily into hardcore punk by that time. And I and I recently had Danny, uh, uh, your drummer, on here, and uh, um, he uh, uh, was uh, uh, – you know, talking to me, you know, about how, you know, how he got, uh, you know, involved in the band and, 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 you know, indoctrinated into agnostic front for you. How did it happen? Because I know a lot of you guys obviously traveling in the same circles, you know what I mean? End up in a lot of each other's bands or whatever, but for you specifically, how do you end up in agnostic front? Does somebody drop a call to you? I mean, you, you, you know, when they wanted to go like with another guitar player, how do, how do they get a hold of you? What happened was I was in a band called Ramallah at the time. Mm-hmm. And we weren't, uh, we had plans to, to, to do some heavy touring and then plans changed. And, uh, you know, I hung up the phone with one of the guys from, uh, from that band. And like 30 seconds later, I get a phone call from my buddy, Ian played bass with me in a uh, blood for blood. Mm -hmm. Just came right out and asked, he's like, Hey, AF needs a guitar player. Are you interested? Like, you know what? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So 30 seconds later, I get a phone call from Roger. And he's like, uh, so here, call Mike Gallo, find out what songs uh, he wants you to learn. And uh, why don't you guys set up rehearsal? We have a lot of tours coming up. Wow. So I learned, what was it? I think it was, this was a Thursday. And I went down that Monday. I think I learned like 20 songs. Um, and that was it. It wasn't like an audition or anything. It was just let's jam and see how it feels, and that was it. Yeah, very serendipitous though that that it's your first hardcore show that really resonates with you, and then you end up in the band. That's kind of crazy though, right? I mean, <laughs> it is. It is. Now these guys are obviously notorious road dogs, as I said earlier, man. I, I, I mean, for guys that have been doing it as long as they have, there's it doesn't seem to be any taking the foot off the gas, but you know. As you get older, and you know, of course, only speaking, you know, for yourself, uh, uh, do you still do you still uh, in, enjoy touring? You know, like this much? You know, do you like that? You know, life on the road. I mean, you, you know, leaving the family. You know, I mean, going off or whatever. You know, is that still something that's appealing to you? Sure, it's what I do. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, because of the pandemic. You know, one thing that I promised myself was, you know, all the things that all of us used to complain about on the road that I would never complain about any of them again. Cause I'm right. grateful to be doing this at all. Yeah. Like three years ago, I thought this, I thought it was all over. Yeah. Uh, so and, know, and we're not, we're, we're not getting any younger either. So right. Right. We'll do it for as long as we can, but. You know, did you ever think with everything that Roger's been through and, you know, obviously he's battled, you know, his issues with cancer and, you know, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, you know, Vinny Stigma turning 68 years old, uh, it, 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 you know, it seems like these guys are going to do it till the wheels fall off, though. But did you ever think at any time when Roger's battling his health problems, you know, and, and Vinny is getting up there in age, you know, that these guys like like might start to take a stance with like, you know what, we don't need to do this or we don't need to do this as much. Well, that's entirely their decision. I mean, right. uh, I was nervous about going on the road with Roger the last couple of times. Uh, you know, he's still, it's, you know, he had the surgeries for, for his cancer and everything. That's fine. But it's still something that they really need to keep a close eye on for the next few years. And, you know, sure. He's, he's his own man. He makes his own decisions. Right. But, you right. Know, I, I told him, it's like, I'm more concerned about your health. The plan shows, you know, as long as you get cleared by your doctor, um, I'd rather well, see him rest up and make sure he's okay, but I well, can't make and, decisions for him. Well, and Roger is also a lot of the guy who does like a lot of like the business dealings for the band as well, right? He's mm -hmm. kind of like your, you know, he's kind of like, he's kind of like management in a sense. Well, yeah, we're, it's a self-managed band. He handles everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
And so he seems to relish that role. I mean, someone's got to do it in the band, right? I mean, yeah, I'm sure. It's, I tell you right now, it's it's no. I, I've done it a bunch of times. It's no fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and Roger's a super serious guy, so it's you know, he gets. It's a stressful. It's a stressful thing to handle. Have you had to make any changes as you've gotten older, though, in playing this kind of music? Because, I, you know, obviously, and, you know, I got to see you guys last year. Uh, I'll be coming to the Syracuse show in September here. Uh, you know, what you guys do on stage and that exchange of energy between, like, you and the audience, you, you, you know, it, it just seems like the momentum and the stakes just go up as the show goes on or whatever. And obviously, you, you, I mean, like, that kind of pounding night in and night out. Have you had to change the way you play or approach, you know, especially in a live setting as you've gotten older? you know has anything changed for your uh, approach or your attack on stage well i don't you know jump around like a chimpanzee anymore uh <laughs> my days of doing that are over yeah. knee surgeries uh uh you know, it's it's our job to provide the soundtrack yeah it's everybody else's job to move around right right <laughs> like guys like pete kohler from sick of it all there are very few guys like that in our age group that can do it like that yeah um, Yo, my just you know, I never changed the way I play. I play pretty aggressively, and hard. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just kind of plant myself there and do my thing. I let you know stigma run back and forth, do, yeah. do his thing. But uh, yeah, for a bunch of old guys, we do okay. I found it very hard the last time because I was up against the barricade and a lot of moshing going on behind me. And uh, you know, full disclosure, I mean, I'm 50 years old, but you know. 20, 30 years ago, I, I would have been right there. It, and it was very hard hearing all those songs to not want to get pulled into the pit. But, you know, a lot like you, you know, I've had a couple of back surgeries. You know what I mean? You got to know that, like, uh, you, you know, that the moshing has kind of become like a young man's game. Oh, absolutely. It was, <laughs> I stopped dancing when I was 19 years old. I you know, stage dived until I was in my mid-20s. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I stopped dancing when I, when I was still in my teens. So. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask, and I don't want to hear about it in the comment section at all, though. But uh, any plans on, and I might have asked you this the last time, any plans on any new music from Agnostic Front? Uh, you know, How yeah. far along in the process are you guys? Well, we had planned on really uh, going in last year to record a new record, because our last record it was coming up on four years. Yeah. In release Get Loud. And it sucked, years. because the whole pandemic thing happened, and it did, we didn't really get to tour on that record. Yeah. Uh, just like a lot of other bands, but uh, Mike and I have a lot of music written. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, we have a Euro tour coming up uh, uh, in, a, in a week. Uh, it's two and a half weeks long. Then we have like a ten day thing with Murphy's Law and Great. That's where I'll be seeing you. Yep. Yep. Um, then uh, then we have some South American dates in November. And there are some, uh, I think there are some West Coast dates for December that haven't been announced yet. US yeah. Dates. But uh, yeah, after that next year, we definitely, we're definitely going to go and record at some point. Hopefully before, uh, before March. And what's the creative process like? Obviously, like you said, you wrote a lot of the music, but like lyrically though, who handles a lot of that? Is that strictly Roger's uh, uh, domain? Gallo writes a lot of lyrics. Uh, and so does Roger. But the uh, the music is, is you know, written by uh, uh, Mike Gallo and I. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, obviously, and I I learned this from talking to Danny. You know, a lot of you guys are here on the East Coast. You know, you find it hard. I mean, obviously, you guys have been doing this for a long time. You, you know, I, I I don't know, not being a musician myself, you know, how much rehearsal or or, or and, and whatnot goes into a band. But obviously, Rogers out on the other coast, or you know, out, out, out west. You know, how does that uh, affect the band? Everybody not being able to get into a room and play together. That doesn't really affect us because. The four of us are, are East Coast guys. It's it's a four hour drive for me. Yeah. To uh, Queens where we rehearse. Uh, Roger, we uh, we record the stuff and then send it to him. Yeah. And then he you know, gives us his ideas with a garage band or whatever. We go back and forth. And forth. Let's go on tour. That's when it all comes together. Um, and that's where we demo. I'm losing your audio a little bit. Is that better? There we go. There we go. Yep, yep, yep. But uh, yeah, on tour, you load into a venue at noon. 
Yeah. And you have hours <laughs> of doing nothing. So you have plenty of time to yeah. uh, to put songs keep, together. Keep your and chops that's, what we do. That's, how, that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there ba- that, Sorry, Ted. Is there bands out there like right now that you feel like, uh, you, you know, who are kind of carrying that torch for hardcore? Are there any young bands out there that like, you know, in your travels or out on tour or whatever that you kind of, you know, kind of take a notice of? Or or is it hard with so much of an influx of music on these platforms nowadays to even keep track of what's going on out there? It's it's so hard to keep track. Uh, yeah. It's not like it was uh, years ago. It was a tight knit community that there's so many bands now. Yeah, um, it's so hard to keep track of, but uh, you know the 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 younger bands like and, and, and people people get down on them, but I'm, I'm happy to see them do as well as they're doing. A band like Turnstile, um, I, I don't know why people like a lot of people in my age group that they they just take shots at them. Yeah, they're great band and they're, they're doing great. God bless them. Same thing with Code Orange. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm happy for them. Who yeah. Cares? And someone's got, and someone's got to carry that torch. I mean, uh, you, you know, it's either like, you know, it, it's either you kind of try to find some common ground or like these bands or, 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 or you potentially watch a whole genre or a scene die out. I mean, you know, you got to take your pick kind of, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it's a lot of, it's just jealousy. Um, yeah. Like 100%. <laughs> and, and if you had to compare, uh, you know, cause obviously you know, you spent a lot of time, as you mentioned, you know, extensively out in the Boston hardcore scene. Uh, uh, are there similarities? Uh, uh, you know, obviously there's that there's that blue collar East Coast attitude, you know, that you can obviously draw comparisons to the New York hardcore scene. But uh, 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 like, what would be the big fucking differences? Are there any? Not not particularly. Back in the day, there was because you know Boston was primarily straight edge. Uh, OK. You know, all the. uh Bands like SSD, DYS, yeah, uh, Last Right, Slapshot, all those bands were were straight edge, yeah. Um, and you know the the straight edge thing in New York didn't start happening till later on. Uh, you know, bands like Youth of Today they came along. That was later. That wasn't yeah. the early your early eighties, mid eighties. But uh, people looked at Boston as like more of a jockey kind of uh yeah th- th- to uh to a certain extent people wouldn't be wrong in saying that because it kind of was yeah but uh like the 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 early new york hardcore scene was way grittier uh whereas boston was suburban kids yeah uh it was like that's the only difference though i mean the 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 Boston bands were just as nasty, just as aggressive. I agree. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when you're on tour, you know, and you're traveling and you're playing and you're constantly, you know, interacting with a guy like Vinny Stigma, uh, 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 but what do you see? Like, uh, you know, is he really the driving? F- I mean, obviously I know that Roger, you know, really does a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. But it really feels like Vinny Stigma, though, is really kind of like, uh, you know, he's almost like that guy that I would say just uh, epitomizes the whole scene. You know what I mean? Like where he, he's almost like the Peter Pan of the hardcore scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's an analogy for you. All right, so you, you're you in my age group. So you remember you know Johnny Carson, right? Of course. Yeah. Okay. So Stigma is to Roger what Ed McMahon was to Johnny Carson. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, that's exactly. Public Enemy. Yeah, stigma is to Roger what Flavor Flav was to Chuck D. Yeah, the hype you know, man. Stigma is the hype man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, you know, obviously, you guys are both playing the same instrument, uh, but you, you know, you're in the same band. So, like, what chores do you take on, or what guitar duties do you take on? And how do you guys play off of each other? You know what I mean? Like, what's your... Because, you know, I'm not a musician, but you always hear, like, when there's two guitarists in a band, and I don't know how this dichotomy plays out in hardcore, but, you know, typically, like, you'll hear, oh, that guy's the lead guitar player, that guy's the rhythm guitar player. Like, what's you guys' roles in, in that in that band? I just say, I'm me, and stigma, stigma. Um, <laughs> stigma just, you know, he does his own thing. 
On a level hey, of bless. guitar playing, on a level of guitar playing, though, man, I, I, and he's been doing it for so long, and I don't want you to run down his guitar playing or put yours on a pedestal. But like, you know, how do you work the different parts out, though? Is somebody stronger at one thing, you know, than another? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's there would never be two guitar, two guitar bands if if that wasn't the case, right? Um, but yeah, um, you know, my job is to just play guitar and. Stigma's job is to just be stigma. Yeah, like whatever. He's part whatever. showman. He is. He's part showman for sure. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And that's not to run down his guitar playing, but obviously, he, you know, he's one of those like larger than life characters in that scene where like I almost feel like, you know, he's somebody that people are really looking forward to seeing when they come and see Agnostic oh, Front, though. You know, without it, without a doubt. Yeah, he's got to be he, he he's got to be one of those guys like post show or even pre show, probably very popular with the fans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would sure. imagine, and 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 so Danny, I asked Danny in this interview, but uh, uh, you know, uh, what does Danny bring to the band? Because obviously, Agnostic Front has, uh, as have a lot of hardcore bands. You know, they run the gamut of a lot of different members. Like when you go on on Google and you Wikipedia a lot of the bands, and we just, I've just made mention of this. You know, it's like a roster of everybody that ever lived in New York City that's played in a lot of these bands. You know, sure. I mean, you, you know, who's a musician? To, you, you know, so specifically, what's Danny brought to the fold? Well, Danny is not only a, a great drummer but a really good guy and yeah. what he's and he's not like a, like a kid but you know he brings an energy that was kind of missing before and that's not to to put our previous drummer down he's a great drummer but playing drums in a hardcore band that is without a doubt the hardest job in the band yeah and you can't slow down it's hard and the older yeah. you get the harder that is to, to to keep up with yeah so danny has kind of brought that energy back um where you know especially with the older songs they're they got a little little pep in their step again yeah so and 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 when you guys go and tour uh, uh, you know, because I saw some of the footage there where you, you, you know, you're overseas. You know, those European audiences were just really giving you that energy back. I mean, just a, s some great footage that you and Danny had put up there with the sing-alongs and stuff like that. Uh, the, do you notice a difference with American audiences and European audiences, and and how they receive the Agnostic Front uh, music? Yeah, uh, so, like, our set list when we play overseas are completely different than what we play over here. Uh, like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people that come to see us in the States, they don't know anything that's, uh, any newer material aside from gotta go. Yeah. Like they don't know anything at all past like, uh, Liberty and justice. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we just play old school songs. Uh, yeah. whereas in Europe, it's the opposite. It's crazy to me when I joined first joined the band and that's what i was told uh and said uh well, what songs do you know it's like i know the first three albums inside out yeah like, well, we don't play much from those records what <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so yeah i hadn't heard a lot of the later stuff um that we uh that we have in our euro sets so so how yeah, does that get worked out? How does that get worked out? That you guys have such a deep, uh, you, you know, a deep catalog. You know, who decides that stuff? Do you guys all have input and chime in a couple songs that you'd like on the set list? Is that strictly Roger and Vinny? How, you know, I could be, you know, because no, as, you know, as you say, you guys do got a lot of classics, and I imagine you know people want to come away from a lot of those shows, and they want to hear your Victim and Pains and your Blind Justice and your Crucified and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, who works the set list out? We all do. Like Roger, well, me, Roger, and Gallo, really. Like Roger will have a rough set list and he'll ask us what we think we'll move songs around add some in take some out um and like with roger sometimes it's just off the cuff i mean if if, if we're playing a show and things aren't going the way that he thinks they should he'll pull out a song that's not even on the set list yeah one that we haven't played for like two years yeah so, is that hard for you guys when he does that no you just have to keep your ears open yeah yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> it, 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 well, yeah, because Danny, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I believe in my conversation with Danny that he did make mention that Roger's really one of those guys who can really read a room really well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's funny that you, that's very consistent with what he said, though, too. You know, a lot of times he might even like maybe like, like I think he may mention that like he may even like look out and kind of, you know, kind of gauge a crowd like, you know, I think these songs might go over good tonight. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's an art. That's an art. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, sometimes I see it like if people paid their money if they just want to stand there. That's really up to them. I mean, there's only so much you can do, right? You know, to get a room going. If it ain't there, it ain't there. It's it's not. Sometimes it's not the band. It's just, they just want to stand there. I've I've seen that yeah. happen lots of times. Um, now I've asked this question to a lot of the hardcore artists who I've had on here, and you, you know the answer can you know can vary from different people. I, I had Paul Bearer on, who obviously you know named some older bands or whatever. But you know who's the Mount Rushmore of hardcore in your mind? You got to put four of them up there, and of course you can name Agnostic Front, even though you're in the band. I don't think that'll look too pretentious. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, bad brains. Okay. Hold on, you got frozen there for a minute. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Bad brains. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Black flag. Yep. Agnostic front. And then I go with SSD. Nice, nice. Yeah, see, yeah, see, Paul kind of went with some of those. I can't remember you verbatim, but he had like poison idea. You know what I mean? But he's also from an, a, a little bit of an older generation as well. So uh, love, you know, love, love, to, love poison idea. Pig champion yeah. is one of my favorite guitar players ever. Very, very underrated. But uh, I liked them, but they weren't, and they were influential, but bad brains, no bad brains, no hardcore punk. Yeah, I agree with you there. I agree with you. Are there other guys, are there other guys in the scene, other guitar players? Obviously, we mentioned Vinny or whatever, but are there other hardcore guitar players, you know, who's playing that you look at, you know, as a fan and say, geez, I really enjoy his playing? Greg Ginn, without yeah. a doubt. Huge influence yeah. for me when I was a kid. Yeah. I, could, uh, I could tell that he could play for real. Yeah. Um, but like how he incorporated all that noise, it did so unique for its, yeah. for its time. Very. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but him, Pig Champion, uh, uh, Bubba Dupree from a band yeah. called Void. Yep. Okay. Um, Uh, you know, Doug Holland in Paris, uh, Mayhew yeah. from Chromags. Yeah. Because uh, those were guys, those were the first guys that you know, they could, they could, that could really, they could play, play. Yeah. Um, Jesus. Yeah, I kind of complimented. Yeah, I kind of complimented Joe from Wisdom and Chains when I had him on here because you know they're another band who like you know the instrumentation in the way they play. You, you know I mean, they're doing some very interesting things in there that you don't hear in hardcore a lot. Mm. Yeah, but that happens. It's it's happening more and more. Yeah, uh, with the younger bands. Yeah, because now I, I played in thrash metal bands up until I was what, nineteen years old. Yeah, because nobody that I knew that played hardcore could play. It was so hard to play with a drummer that can't keep time. Is, yeah, it didn't interest me. <laughs> yeah, but as time gone, as time went on, even back then, uh, when the whole crossover thing started in like the late eighties, like some metal dudes went over to start playing, uh, uh, you know, incorporating hardcore into their sound. You know, Chromags are hugely responsible for that. Crumb yeah. suckers. Yeah. Um, leeway. Yeah. But those were all bands that had solid players. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was. I had no interest to 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 play with people that couldn't play their instruments back then. Uh, but like now, <laughs> like these, there's some real ringers out there that play in these bands. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and did you like? Metal guys. And and did you like when that whole crossover thing? You know, what I mean, like being somebody who started liking thrash. And then, you know, and then developing an affinity for hardcore, you know, did you like that, uh, th that whole crossover kind of sound? I know Agnostic Front, uh, you know, a lot of the Pierce fans, like, weren't really too hot on, uh, what was it, Cause for Alarm is when Cause they started to really kind of go crossover? No, uh, and I, so, 
that was my first letdown cause for alarm. It took me, I, I got used to it after yeah. a while. <laughs> um, the best wishes by Chromag, same thing. Yeah. It, uh, uh, you know, uh, beast on my back by crumb suckers. Yeah. Like, like if I want to listen to thrash metal, I'll listen to thrash metal. I'll listen to Exodus. You know? Right, I'm right. Not, like, they're good at what they do. Right. It'd be like if, you know, a band like Testament wanted to write up like an old school hardcore record. Right. Like stick to what you're good at. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but all those records grew on me in time. Uh, you know, just being young and closed minded and wanting to hear, you know, what you, you know, what you thought these bands should have been doing, not what they wanted to do, not the direction that they wanted to go in. You right. Know, when you're, you know, 15, 16 year old kid, you're close minded. And I was extremely close minded. Is there anything off cause for alarm that you guys currently play in concert or has that album kind of been, been swept under the rug? Well, we always play the eliminator. Yeah. Um, uh, toxic shock sometimes, yeah. uh, once in a while. We'll play public assistance, but you know, Roger doesn't like playing that song anymore because you know that's that was always a controversial song lyrically. Sure, People took sure. it the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I think that's all we play from Pause for Alarm. I don't think we play anything else. Are there specific songs that you guys play in concert that you do get an extra charge from playing? You bring it personally. Me, whenever we play, I, I get excited when we play. Like a victim in pain set. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that record. Um, yeah. It, even though technically it's not an LP, I think it's, I think it's 12 and a half minutes long. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not very long. You blink, you miss the whole thing. <laughs> but that's, uh, that record is, it's flawless in my opinion. I love yeah. it. It's so, it's so nasty. It's so just primitive yeah car is slightly out of tune i love it and i will always say that about the uh i will always say that about the uh i've even got the cover hanging up I've been back up there uh the agnostic front live at cbgb's uh from i guess this would have been what 88 89 it is 88 yeah i mean you know that's a great live show a phenomenal sure. i mean you, you know I, I obviously like when they do a uh a, 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 an album like that you know and maybe you being a musician you know you could shed some light on this you know when a, when a hardcore band cuts an album like that is that is that sound taken like what directly from a like a like a soundboard is, is that is it because that's a great sounding hardcore live album yeah i i can't say because i'm not in a band i wasn't in the band at the time i'm not sure how it was mixed uh but i'm pretty sure that uh, there was minimal touch-ups yeah. on that record. I mean, there may have been a guitar overdub here and there. I really don't know. But there's but, guys on there, but there's guys on there getting up on stage and having their say on the microphone. I mean, it's sure. very raw and very primitive. You know, well, I mean, that's I how you want it to be. Funny I mean, down there singing. <laughs> that's uh it's it's no different than uh uh Kiss Alive and Kiss Alive 2. Yeah. Like, there's a misconception that there was like a, a fake crowd added in. It's not. The, the crowd was mic'd. Yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. you'll never, like th those live records, and everybody copied them. Yeah. Because live records were throwaways back then. They're super yeah. cheap to make. Right. But all that was was just the crowd was mic'd. So you felt like you were actually at a show. Yeah. That's and what I love about it the most, I think. Yeah. Me too. When I was a kid, like I had the cape just open up. The, the the cover for a live two and just listen to the record yeah in front of my little stereo it, it felt like you were there um, yeah so i think that that comparing that with like live at cbgb it's the same kind of thing like the experience there's like a mic gets knocked out of roger's hand there's no vocals like there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on people going up there singing little yeah. feedback here and there it's, you're it's, it's that's that's what the shows were like yeah yeah. And, and, uh, um, when you guys go out now and I'm sure this doesn't happen to agnostic front a lot these days, but you know, maybe it's happened to you at some point in your career and you maybe talk to me about the mindset a little bit. Like when you go out to do like a club show and, uh, uh, you, you, you know, you're geared up to go out and play a show at a small club and maybe you come out and there's like eight or 10 people there. Is that absolutely fucking hard to get yourself geared up for a show like that? Obviously that probably doesn't happen at, at the stage of Agnostic Front's career or maybe any stage of, of their career, but in other, in, in other hardcore bands that you've been in, you know what I mean? Is it hard to get that energy up for a show like that? 
No, um, it hasn't happened in a long time. But yeah, it, 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 even if it shows a show, yeah, There's eight people, eight thousand. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It shows a show. Is it easier to play the bigger shows, or is it, or, or do you prefer like what you you know like you just like I mentioned, you just put up a lot of footage from festivals or whatever. Do you like those the, that big sea of people, or do you like a smaller intimate setting? It's so weird to me that bands like us even play festivals with that many people in attendance after all these years it's just yeah, weird yeah. because i remember being a kid and like, playing the rat in boston and they played a sunday matinee and you know there were 350 people in there you're like wow yeah it's like it's never gonna get any better than this yeah um you know i, I actually prefer those shows i like the smaller venues like 300 400 people jam-packed yeah you know, the 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 festivals they're nice and all it's weird because there's a huge barrier between you and the crowd. Yeah. Um, but that's like everybody's kind of like ACDC fantasy moment when they take pictures. We're, you know, we all do it. Like right. after one of those shows and just see a people, like it's not because of us. Right. Because we're on a festival. Most of these festivals sell up before any of the bands are announced. Right. And right. It's not because of us that all those people. Right. Are right. But, but it's nice to play those shows just the same. But it does seem like it's the antithesis of hardcore, though, to see you guys put footage up of you guys on a huge stage with like eighty thousand people out there, and you know, as you said, people aren't right there in Roger's face and stuff. You know, I mean, it 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 it, it does look like a fish out of water almost. You know, what I mean, Cause that's, uh, absolutely, because that's not the that's not the hardcore norm usually. You know, usually they're handing off the mic and people are singing for them. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a lot of energy. I enjoy it. It shows a show. It's. And festivals, I mean, we always have lots of friends there. It's great to hang out. Yeah. But like I said, I prefer I prefer the 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 mid sized club shows the best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I can't thank you enough uh, uh, for taking some time and running this interview back with me. I was absolutely fucking gutted and crushed when I lost those episodes. You know, you, yours was among four or five other ones, man. And uh, thankfully, everybody has been pretty understanding technology, you know, doing what it does to us, you know, sometimes fucking us over royally, which in essence is what happened to me. But uh, I really appreciate you doing this. And it's as always, it's a great honor getting the chance to talk to you, man. I will see you at the show in September. Danny's put me on the list. Great All guy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll be there to say hi for sure, man. I'll, I'll, I'll come over and uh, hopefully we can meet in person, man. And, uh, for sure, absolutely. You know, get a chance to chop it up a little bit, uh, you know, face-to-face. -face. So uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm actually going to uh, – two nights before that, I, 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 there's a new venue opening up in Syracuse. You guys aren't going to be at the Lost Horizon. There's apparently a new venue called The Song and Dance, which doesn't sound like it should be catering to bands like you guys at all. But, you know, no. you guys are going to be there. And then two nights before, I, I'm hoping to get out there to see Madball as well. So – yeah, I've never played anywhere else in Syracuse other than the Lost Horizon. Yeah. I don't think I've ever played anywhere else up there. I mean, it's the quintessential dive bar. I mean, it's a yeah. classic room, though. I mean, I've been going there since I was a teenager and just seen a lot of great bands there. And I love it. It's got the low ceiling and, yeah. you, you, you know, the small stage. And, you know, when you're out in the park a lot, the building just kind of rumbles. It's just one of those old classic, you know, you know good venues, you know. Yeah. It's but, fun. yeah, I'm totally looking forward to it. And I thanks so much, Craig, for doing this again, man. It's been Anytime a blast talking to you, as always, brother. And uh, I'll see you in September, man. All right, man. All right. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you man. Sir. Later. All right. All right. And now Craig's going to figure out how to get off of here. <laughs> and we're going to watch. Uh, there should be a red button down there at the bottom. Oh, I got Yeah. I'm, I'm, there I'm, you go. Later, I'm, brother. <laughs> there he goes, folks. That is Craig Silverman, guitar player for Agnostic Front. If you don't know, get the fuck off my channel. For fuck's sake, Agnostic Front are, as their documentary that was made about them uh, says, the godfathers of hardcore. Uh, and Craig has, has, has been doing the hardcore thing, a stalwart, a mainstay, a fixture uh, in, 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 in the Boston slash New York hardcore scene for years and years and years and years. Uh, he's, you know, he's been doing it. He's been doing it. He's an OG, uh, a hardcore uh, warrior. Uh, and right now, He's got one of the most enviable gigs in the business, man. I mean, if you're an agnostic front, I mean, you know, they're the pinnacle, at, at least for me, you know, and that's not to impugn the Crow Mags, sick of it all, Madball, Mur Murphy's Law, who they're going to be going out and doing shows with, you know, New York hardcore. And I've said it before on this show, the best. I may be biased because I am an upstate New Yorker, man, but I defy somebody in the comment section or anywhere to point out a better 
fucking hardcore scene than New York or, or the Northeast of the United States. Uh, and I will fight you on this point. So bring it on. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I will be going to see the boys in September. Really looking forward to that. Uh, you know what you're going to get with Agnostic Front, and it's going to be a kick-ass, energetic, fucking in-your-face fucking show uh, of some of the most classic, badass, fucking hardcore you will ever fucking hear, bar none. There, I said it. Uh, Vinny Stigma, uh, Roger Moret. I mean, these guys have kept Agnostic Front going for fucking 40 fucking years, and uh, uh, doesn't look like there's any sign of letting up. As he made mention, Vinny Stigma, turning 68 years old. Roger has battled health issues. These guys are still out there fucking playing bands half their age under the fucking table, man. No question about it, man. Uh, the agnostic front machine still going fucking strong. And I imagine it will be for quite a long fucking time. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, Craig was one of my interviews that got lost in my technical difficulties, as I mentioned at the top of the show. So, uh, super cool that he came on here and, uh, granted me another interview. Couldn't appreciate it more. Great guy, great fucking band, great guitar player. And, uh, can't wait to see him. Uh, not one of the best, the best. I will say it, man. Agnostic front, the best. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Thank you so much for Craig Silverman for doing that, man. Always a pleasure getting a chance to talk with him. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And remember until we get together and we do this thing again, Please remember to take it easy and keep it sleazy.